Joshua. What a great book. Moses anointed Joshua as the new leader of Israel at the end of Deuteronomy. Joshua's book basically covers 20 years of his leadership of the people as they enter into and conquer the promised land. They divide up the land and then Joshua gives his farewell address and dies. Who wrote the book of Joshua? Joshua did. And probably one other person finished it up and possibly did some editing. It was likely written between 1400 and 1370 BC. It tells how the promised land was conquered, but you've seen that it is also an illustration of the Christian life, how following God closely in obedience leads to blessing. Here is a review of the book. In Joshua chapter 1, we learned that the promised land is our inheritance. God's people were not led out of slavery and sin just to flounder in the wilderness. God has something better, a better land for us, if we will just believe him and trust him. In Joshua chapter 2, we were introduced to Rahab the harlot. Even though she was an outsider to the covenant and a sinner, she was rewarded for her faith. She was even commended for her faith in the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. Rahab's story is an example of God's grace to sinners and salvation by faith alone. By God's grace, she was included in the Messianic line and mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5. In Joshua chapter 3, the Israelites crossed over the Jordan River. God parted it for them. It took faith to cross over into uncharted territory. But that's what promised land people do. They follow God and they walk by faith and not by sight. In Joshua chapters 4 and 5, the people set up stones as a monument of remembrance. One clear theme of this part of the Bible is that God's people are prone to forgetfulness. We need to set up markers for our benefit and for the benefit of future generations. In Joshua chapter 6, God knocked down the walls of Jericho. God had a plan. It involved a lot of marching. It didn't make much sense, but then God's plans don't always make sense. We just have to be obedient. In Joshua chapter 7, Achan happened. Because Achan did not trust God and he stole from God, he caused the whole nation to suffer defeat at Ai. What's a little bit of sin? It reminds us that our purity is a whole lot more important to God than to us. A little bit of sin can affect a whole lot of people. In Joshua chapter 8, the Israelites are given a second chance to take Ai after they purify the camp. We are glad that our God is a God of second chances. In Joshua chapters 9 and 10, the Israelites take a detour to worship God and hear his laws read again right in the middle of enemy territory. And then they get in a huge battle and God fights alongside of them and has the sun stand still at Joshua's request. God can do the impossible when his people ask for it and they trust him. In Joshua chapters 11 through 14, we reunite with Caleb, one of the two spies that believed the promised land could be taken 45 years prior. Now, this 85-year-old man's courage came from his faith in God. The land is divided up in chapters 15 through 19. It's boring reading, but then it's the point of the book and the fulfillment of God's promised to Abraham 600 years before. They took the land God gave them over a period of five years, and they settled in it. In Joshua chapter 20, we learned about cities of refuge. God established cities of refuge so that those who accidentally killed someone could live there without fear of retribution. Some theologians have linked these cities to Jesus Christ, in principle, anyway. Christ is our refuge. We can always turn to him. In Joshua chapter 21, we read the conclusion and the theme of the book of Joshua, and I don't mind at all sharing this with you again. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. 
The book of Joshua has an overriding theological theme of rest. The Israelites, after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, finally entered the rest God had prepared for them in the land of Canaan. You might remember that uh, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 3 uses this incident as a warning to us not to let unbelief keep us from entering into God's rest in Christ. Last week, we covered Joshua chapters 22 and 23, which is a speech from Joshua reminding the people that the Lord fights for them. This generation was different from the one that died in the wilderness. This generation trusted and obeyed God, and they needed to continue to do so. And they proved that they were different over and over. When an internal conflict arose and two and a half tribes rubbed the rest of the nation the wrong way, they resolved the issue in a godly way, preserving the purity of the nation and also promoting unity and faith. The only other lesson that didn't uh, fit into this study, and, and I think I'd be remiss if I did not mention it, was the importance of mentorship. Uh, Moses was a, a mentor to Joshua, and we see the results of this relationship in Joshua's leadership of the Promised Land generation. For years, Joshua had been close to Moses. There are four verses in the Bible that call Joshua Moses' aid or assistant. I want to give you two of these um, earlier, much earlier uh, in this story. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. At the end of Moses' life, after Moses sinned in front of the whole nation, Moses tells the people, um, Deuteronomy 1 and verses 37 and 38, Because of you, the Lord became angry with me, and also said, You shall not enter it either. But your assistant, Joshua, son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him, because he will lead Israel to inherit it. Joshua was relatively young when the Israelites left Egypt. He watched Moses as Moses followed God in a very personal way. He learned to pray from Moses. He learned how to obey through the example of Moses. Joshua apparently also learned from the negative example that cost Moses the joy of entering the promised land. This is a reminder that um, someone somewhere is watching you. Some younger person or someone uh, that you are influencing is, is seeing how you live and how you react to life circumstances. Someone is learning from you. Someone will follow your example. Mentoring is far more than the words that are spoken by the mentor. Your entire life is on display. Remember how the author of Hebrews scolded his readers for not being teachers already. You are called to not only walk the walk and talk the talk, but to teach others to do the same. Without Moses, Joshua is not Joshua. This is a story that uh, has been told many times. You might have heard it before, but uh, it's so powerful. It was July 1st, 1885, when Edward Kimball felt the tugging of the spirit to share his faith with a young shoe salesman he knew. At first, Kimball vacillated, unsure if he should talk to the man. But he finally mustered his courage and went into the shoe store. There, Kimball found the salesman in the back room stocking shoes, and he began to share his faith with him. As a result, the young shoe salesman prayed and received Jesus Christ that day. That shoe salesman's name was Dwight L. Moody, and he became the greatest evangelist of his generation. But the story doesn't end there. Several years later, a pastor and well-known author uh, by the name of Frederick B. Meyer heard Moody preach. Meyer was so deeply stirred by Moody's preaching that he himself embarked on a far-reaching evangelistic ministry. Once, when Meyer was preaching, a college student named Wilbur Chapman embraced Christ, accepted him as his Lord and Savior as a result of the presentation of the gospel. Chapman later employed a baseball player to help him prepare to conduct an evangelistic crusade. That ball player, who later became a powerful evangelist himself, was Billy Sunday. In 1924, a group of businessmen invited Billy Sunday to hold an evangelistic campaign in Charlotte, North Carolina which resulted in many people coming to faith in Christ. Out of that revival meeting, a group of men formed a men's prayer group to pray for the world. 
they prayed for Charlotte to have another great revival. God sent another evangelist named Mordecai Ham. Ham went to Charlotte in 1934 to hold a crusade. Ham's crusade went well, even though it didn't have many converts. On one of the last nights under the big tent, one tall, lanky young man uh, walked up the aisle to receive Christ. That man's name was Billy Graham. Talk about a chain of events, and it all started with an ordinary Christian named Edward Kimball, who reached D.L. Moody, who reached Wilbur Chapman, who reached Billy Sunday, who reached Mordecai Ham, who reached Billy Graham. Look what God has done over these years because of the faithfulness of one man in a shoe store. Well, that brings us to the final chapter of Joshua, the last chapter and maybe the most familiar verse in the book to you. We are in Joshua chapter 24 and reading his farewell address. If you have your Bible, you want to follow along, Joshua 24, I'll read the first 13 verses. Joshua then assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam, so he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as also did the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites, but I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also the two Amorite kings, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant." What is Joshua doing here? What, what is the Lord doing here? Giving the people a review of their history. To what end? What are they supposed to, to gain from this? From Abraham on, this review illustrates God's sovereignty and grace. Abraham was born into a pagan culture where the Bible just said he worshipped other gods. But God plucked him out and he sent him to a new land. Throughout the entire story, God is the mover. I took, I gave, I assigned, I sent, I afflicted. You know, I've used this illustration before, but uh, all of us are turtles on a fence post. When you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there all by himself. Here's the first point today. God deserves the credit for all of our blessings. There are many things that we can do to help ourselves, but there are many more things that we didn't do to end up where we are. We couldn't control who our parents were, or where we were born, or so many developmental decisions that put us in a place where we could finally succeed. Even our gifts, talents, and abilities came from God. The climax of this history lesson has God reminding the people, lest they forget, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olives groves that you did not plant. God deserves the credit. He gets all the glory and all the praise. In light of this truth, Joshua gives the people a charge in verse 14. 
Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now, if there are any verses that you are familiar with in this book, the book of Joshua, those are the likeliest candidates. He begins by saying, fear the Lord. And some people, uh, this might shock you, don't like the word fear. They prefer the word revere. Uh, one Bible translation says, honor the Lord. Another one says, worship the Lord. But most translations use the best word, fear. For the Christian believer, the fear of God is not the fear of judgment or separation from God. These are just not in your future. The fear of God is an understanding that God is holy and just and righteous. He is unlike us. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. When we know who God is, we have a reverential fear, a sense of his immense holiness. It changes the way that we live. God's children are called to fear him. Now, some people prefer the word respect. And while respect is definitely included in the concept of fearing God, there is more to it than that. A biblical fear of God for the believer includes understanding how much God hates sin and, and uh, understanding that his judgment on sin is, is right and just even in the life of a believer. Hebrews 12 and verses 5 and 6 say, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. God disciplines those he loves. That's a little bit scary. Well-behaved children have a healthy fear of discipline from their parents that keeps them from doing bad things all the time. The same should be true in our relationship with God. We should fear his discipline and seek to live lives that please him. The fear of God means that uh, we're not terrified of God, but that we do respect him, we also obey him, we submit to him, and we worship him with reverential awe. Go back and do your own independent Bible study in which you look at all the times in the Bible someone came face to face with God Almighty or the glorified Jesus and you will see a whole lot of people face down and trembling. Why? Because God is bigger and God is greater and God is holy. And when people meet God, they have an overwhelming sense of their unworthiness. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You know, it's hard to imagine that uh, after all that they had experienced, that the people would still be tempted by idols. But they were, and they would be. Joshua called the people to a wholehearted commitment. Commit now. Choose now. That will help you later when the temptation hits you like a diesel truck. You know what gets me about these verses? I, uh, I bet I've read them through hundreds of times, and usually out of context. This time through, I read them in light of all that the nation had experienced to this point. I mean, 400 years of slavery in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, then the conquest of the Promised Land, where they learned that undivided holiness was vitally important. One man's sin could invite discipline on the entire nation. So when Joshua says, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. He, he's not encouraging idolatry. He's not saying that there's two equal options. He knew what was best for each household would be best for the entire community. This is not a charge for individuals. This is a charge for everyone. This is not saying, hey, what's right for you is right for you, and what's right for me is right for me, and this is the choice that I'm making. No, this is an encouragement for everyone everyone to make the right choice, to serve the Lord. 
And the people gave Joshua the response that he was looking for in verse 16. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents out of Egypt and from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. The people said, the Lord has always been and always will be our God. Yes, that is the right response. Now, <laughs> the next verses are kind of strange as uh, is Joshua challenges them on their commitment. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God and he is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. Joshua's words are, uh, well, they're a little bit unexpected. Instead of patting them on the back uh, uh, for, for their response, he says, no, you can't do it. What do you make of this? He is not trying to discourage them. He is emphasizing the cost of this commitment. Now, some scholars think this is prophetic, that he is predicting their demise. But the, peoples dig in, the people dig in and they say, we will serve the Lord our God. We are going to obey him. Verse 25. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance." Another monument or marker was a reminder of the covenant promises the nation made. And I like how uh, Joshua personified the marker. This stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. That brings us to the final verses of this book. Verse 29. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at timnath Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. And then there's a couple more verses that basically just draw things to a close. It's a good conclusion. Joshua is buried in the promised land. That last verse is a testimony to his influence. The people were faithful to God throughout his years. He was faithful. The people were faithful. And at least one great generation experienced the fullness of God's blessings. I read where, uh, where one preacher compared Joshua's final speech to a football coach, uh, scolding and challenging his players at halftime. I don't think you guys can win this game. I don't think you want it bad enough. I don't think you have it in you to, to dig down deep and do what it takes. And then the team takes the field motivated to prove the coach wrong. And when they do prove the coach wrong by winning the game, he is happy. And they are happy. And no matter what happens the next game or in the next generation, this game is a victory. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this book, for this study over these past weeks and for what it has meant to us because we want to be the promised land 
generation, Lord. We don't want to be the wilderness generation that, that, that grumbles and rebels and is half-hearted. And we have seen during this time of COVID some people fall away. Uh, Lord, they have fallen away from the church and they have fallen away from the faith. We want to follow you in obedience. We want to follow you wholeheartedly. Uh, God, we want to be that generation that says whatever the Lord wants, that's what we want to we love you. We take your commands seriously. We want to live lives that are pleasing to you in the beautiful land you have given us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.